cracking me up too, Anna. It's fun. It's fun to have fun. This meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. I got to wait for it to show up there. But hi. Hi, everyone. In the meantime, done. Redirecting to the page. There's a picture of me. I don't like it. it sticks this big, giant, stupid Zoom thing there. It. What I do like about that is it makes it seem like I'm moving at an incredibly fast rate on this Zoom, but I don't like that. It, otherwise, right down here, it says Zoom. That's dumb. Or maybe it's over that side. It's that side. I've got it now. I finished the coffee. I have my fancy mug. This is the tea mug. I have my battle teapot. It's made of cast iron and you could use it in a fight if you had to. I'm curious as I live pour this tea, this is the only Facebook, TikTok, this is the only place on TV and the internet where you can see someone pouring tea live and then drinking it. So cherish these moments. Ooh, lovely stuff. Um, does anyone else do this? Like sometimes I, maybe this is a guy thing. Sometimes I think to myself in this room, if someone was breaking in, what would I grab for to defend myself? And I have a cane over here. It's not in hands reach. It's the cane I use to close the door when Grimby makes his way in. That would probably be the thing. There's also a lamp I've thought about. And then this battle teapot here would work pretty good. Those are the kind of the main three defensive tools. I also have this cool antique telescope I got in England. This is a scout's telescope. And look, it's got a sunshade. You can pull this part out to protect your eyes from the sun, block out the sun, getting you right in the eyeball. So this would be good. And it would be like, um, you know, like to, to beat off an attacker using an antique. I think that would earn you some points. That would be kind of neat. You'd probably get bonus points in whatever video game of your life, whatever the scoring system is. Anyhow, I'm being silly. Hello, Nadine. Is there no sound? That is really important. Oh, you're okay. You've got sound now. Who, Nadine, you worried me. That, that's how you stress Adam out. You tell him he's yakking away and that there's no sound coming through. <laughs> hey, Katie, it's nice to have you with us. Um, so, as promised in the description over there, I'm gonna. I've got my client Anna with me. She's waiting in the green room. This is the part that she has to just sit through. Um. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a few things. I share a distinction I've been working on right now that's that's becoming a very large post. So we'll see if I can verbally describe it a little bit. Um, and some of the stuff that's neat for me right now. The first is that I was uh, walking in downtown Victoria, which is very vibrant right now. No apology necessary, Nadine. I'm just I'm just teasing. Um, Victoria is very vibrant right now. We've been you know, mostly locked down, shut down for two years, slowly tourism started to come back last year. And one of the gifts of COVID has been that um, Victoria historically has been, um, you can almost think of it like stodgy or protective might be a better way where like we have this beautiful street called Government Street right down by the harbor. We're an island, we live on an island and the harbor is a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And Government Street runs kind of like it's the, the sort of walking street that tourism walks up. And even though we're Canada, our weather is gorgeous. We're very temperate because of the location, the island where a lot of the rain dumps in Vancouver and not on us. And so as a result, we don't we've got fairly good weather. And so in a place like that, you'd think, man, patios, get out in the sun, drink beer. That's just a no brainer. And yet for the longest time, that hasn't been the case. There's been a lot of like strict laws about licensing and stuff like that. And what COVID did was it kind of said, well, all the businesses are going to fail unless you allow something to shift. And what that did was it allowed all of these sidewalk patios to get built. We've got big sidewalks, but they were just, you couldn't do anything on them. And so now what's really cool is Government Street got mostly made pedestrian primary. So it's a walking street now, which I always think is super cool. And that allowed all the restaurants to push patios out into the sidewalk because now there's more space for pedestrians. And so as a result, um, Victoria's super, super vibrant. It's really fun to walk through. I really, um, some people hate tourism in their town. They're like, ah, it's annoying, the energy. Me, I love it. I love the energy of people coming through my city. I love hosting people. I really want people to feel the charm and magic of the city that I really am committed to like bringing my medicine to and, and that I think is a really beautiful magic city. Um, and I was walking through one of the many markets that get set up during this time of year. And there's this dude that, that, um, sells chain mail. He makes chain mail 
And, uh, and I was just chatting with him because he had pocket watches. And I was like, ooh, I can't pull off the pocket watch to show you, but I got something else to show you. I was like, ooh, that's a cool pocket watch. How much was that? And we started to chat and he was sharing with me like, he likes to play with this stuff and put together little things with his chain mail. And he had these three balls, little balls of chain mail, basically spheres he'd made. And then he pulled this out of his box and he was like, look, I made COVID. And so he made this little chain mail COVID ball, basically. And I was like, I want to buy that. This was not cheap. This was $250 for this silly little thing. Um, but that's okay. You know, for me, when I, when I see something, a piece of art, something that I like, I check, like, do I have the money for this? Is there anything I want more? And if I like it, I buy it. And what I love about this, first of all, I love the, the artistry, you know, that this is not, it's not glued together. There's nothing holding this in the shape of a sphere other than the tension between each of the pieces. So that's, that's quite something. And I love, first of all, just, you know, it's neat. It looks cool to my eyes. I showed it to Bay and she said, boy, that's ugly. <laughs> ah, marriage. Um, but I also, I like it because it serves for me as a reminder of a thing we've all been through, which we probably don't need one, but also there's a bit of an homage in this for me. You know, COVID has brought a lot, a tremendous amount of gifts to me in my life. And it's not that those gifts have come without hardship, you know, nor societally have the gifts of COVID come without hardship. There's been many deaths. We've lost a lot of people. We've had to lock down, you know, lots of challenges, et cetera, et cetera. But um, some of the gifts COVID brought me are it brought my relationship to a point of breakdown, which was essential for us to create the next breakthrough that we created. And, you know, Bay and I are in probably the best place our, our marriage has ever been. Doesn't mean we don't have arguments and fights and all of that stuff because we're humans, but COVID's really brought us closer together. It's um, it's done like some beautiful things in the city of Victoria, and I think in a lot of places, and it's really shaken up some of the tranquilized sort of life as normal that we've been living in. And so I was like, this is cool. I want to take this. So I have a COVID reminder here in case we forgot about it. It's here to remind you. Um, next thing that I'm excited about right now is this device right here. This is called a kabasa. And I, I really like, I'm a percussionist as a musician. It turns out, I didn't even know. So we've got this djembe drum here. I have about three djembes in my house. I've been playing a cajon, which is the, the box you see people sitting on, you know, banging away, which is such a cool instrument because you can kind of take a drum set with you when you have a cajon and it comes with a seat, which is cool. And I was sitting in, I was taking, um, I take classes. Um, I like to play like hip hop beats because that's my, my lineage, I guess. My background growing up, hip hop was the music that I grew up in, the 90s, the golden era of hip hop. So I really like drumming out hip hop beats and uh, funk beats. But it's really cool also to learn African rhythms. Um, they're much different than a lot of Western rhythms. And in sort of learning the, that style of drumming, I start to learn like, oh, I can I can feel how this found its way into jazz or into blues or whatever. And my teacher at one point was, he was talking about the feel for a particular kind of music. The feel being, you know, there's the the, the actual notes that are getting played and then there's the, the feel behind them. So you can just play a note like da, 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 or you can play those same notes like da, 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 which is the, you know, you could draw that out on a sheet of music and it maybe look a little different, but they're really the same notes, they're same quarter notes, the feeling behind them is different. And he pulled out a kabasa and he was like, here's, here's the feel and he started to play with that. And so um, the feel he played went like this, it went. Uh... I'm not gonna keep doing that because that cannot be nice on the ears, but I was immediately like, this instrument rules. How, how does this thing, what is he doing? And I love how he's slapping the sides as he's, as he's playing it and stuff like that. And so um, I just love the myriad of different sort of instruments that exist in the, in the family of percussion instruments and, and how much versatility there is and what we can do with all of them. You know, you can sort of introduce a song or have it come out just by shaking this gently. So that's a kabasa. It's a very cool instrument. I guess it's also called a, Afuche, muy fuego, afuche. 
So that's dope. Tell you about that one. Mike, my mic deleted the sound out. Okay, cool. Maybe if I play it out here. Did that come through? Or did it delete that too? It's good to know. This is the mic I use when I'm coaching clients too. And it does a really good job removing everything but my voice from the conversation. And uh, my dog barking. <laughs> it didn't come through, Anna. It's hilarious. Okay, well, you'll never know what it sounds like. The last thing I want to share with you, uh, sort of um, colloquially, is that the word? Just in terms of like fun stuff, is a song I've been looking for that I heard in ceremony that um, I found very beautiful. And there's a lot of beautiful music played in ayahuasca ceremony. And, um, and then the idea behind the music is that it's, it's not there just to be nice. It's music is played to evoke the medicine. And what that means is the, the, there's the individual experience happening in ceremony and then there's the experience happening in the room. How is the room being in this moment? And the shamans are, are looking, you know, they're noticing at times like, oh, the room seems like very still and quiet and we're kind of at the peak moment. So we might need to interject, inject some energy or the room feels like, um, uh, like disrupted. Like if this is sort of my steadiness, if I'm in my comfort zone and I've got control over everything and I know what's going on and I've got it all handled, that, that's kind of great for everyday life, but that's not what we're looking for in transformation. And the transformational moment, the, the ceremony, we're looking to knock you off of that. And so if the room all feels very calm and kind of grounded, that may be the time where they're going to play music that throws people off. It might sound a little discordant or whatever. And so the music acts as a, a shaman in its own right. It, it helps guide you towards whatever it is that's going to set you free. Um, and so this is a song that's like a very beautiful kind of soothing song. I'm going to post it here. And if I share my screen and play that, what's going to happen is Facebook's going to mute this video. They did that even if I didn't share stuff. But so I'll just give you a sample of how this sounds. This is also how I, <laughs> I go to people that work arrhythmia and I tell them like, hey, I'm looking for a song and and this is how it sounds. It goes Is this ringing a bell? And the person kind of looks at me blank and I'm like So hopefully that gives you guys a bit of an idea of how this song sounds. And that must be nice on the ears. I can't imagine that that isn't pleasant. If that's annoying to you, just imagine the hell my wife and my dog go through because they never get a break from this. <laughs> this is 24 seven, it's going on. Anyhow, I recommend checking out that song. It's really beautiful. It's called Moon Rising, which is a, a really appropriate name for it. Really nice song. Okay, uh, I've yacked for 10, 10, 15 minutes. I'm gonna have a sip of tea. Ooh, ooh, tea. Uh, I'm going to share really quickly something I'm working on right now. Um, morning, Andrew. Um, so the the briefly, I want to share about a piece of content I'm working on, and then we'll bring Anna on. The thing that I'm working with is what I call the ontological basis or model for disease, dis-ease. And... Um, this started as like a, a just an everyday post, you know, a post I would I would typically put up in the morning, and um, generally when I write, I've got a word count thing because I, I can go long. I know that about I can be quite verbose, and I recognize six hundred to eight hundred is about the sweet spot for a Facebook post or a LinkedIn post. That's where people can like they can read it without having to click through to a see more screen. You know, when you you see someone's written something, you click and then it takes you to a whole page, and you're like, fuck this. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I've had that show up for me internally. And so I imagine other people do. And so 600, 800 words, sometimes even less can be really good, but then it becomes a little more challenging for me to speak what I want to speak. 600, 800 words seems to be about the sweet spot. It doesn't demand too much from people's attention. Um, and I can get, I can make the point that I'd like to make. I can take people through the journey that I'm aiming to take them through. So I sat down to start writing this post and um, very quickly it ballooned out. At, at this point, it's about a 4,000 word post. And I started to realize, oh, I'm actually proposing a whole different model for how we look at things like 
what ails us as people, disease, um, problems that we see in our bodies and stuff like that. So I want to talk very briefly about this, just introduce this concept. I'm going to break this up into a whole bunch of posts. And, and I'm also, as I've been working with the plant medicine, I've been meeting people in the medical profession um, and other areas of work that are aiming to create the same kind of shift that I am and that a lot of other people are. And so this is something that I'm going to be bringing to, to them and working with them and, and starting to create some partnerships so we can create a new model for how we support people. So our existing model for disease is one where by and large, you're fine, like you're going along fine, and then a bad thing happens, like an external factor comes into your body, cancer, arthritis, gout, I don't know, staph infection. And the idea in this model is like, it's an external thing that's come into play. And so as a result of relating to it by and large through that lens, we also seek a solution external to ourselves that will address that thing and get it away. So like, oh, I, I broke my leg, fix the, the broken leg, end of story. That's, that's where the conversation starts and ends. And that system over time, like any system, the longer we're in a system, the more entrenched we become inside of it. So if you, let me see if I can come up with an example. Like if you live your life based on the belief that money's running out and you start to try to make even more money to like out to solve that problem, what the, the system you end up stuck in is one that has two beliefs. The money is running out and I must make more money to alleviate that problem. And what happens is over time, your, your life becomes about the fact that money's probably going to run out, so you better make more. And in that system, you become really, really good at making money. And you become really, really good at worrying about money running out. And you become really, really good at managing that fear in your life. And so what, what people in that system end up creating, and, and you can see this if you look in the world, is you end up with like millionaires who are terrified that money's going to run out. And they get involved in a conversation with themselves like, I just need an, a million. Once I get that next million in the bank, then I can take a breath. No, because the system includes putting that money in the bank. And that it also includes that that doesn't alleviate your fear because the fear gets you having more money and so on and so forth. So we, another way to think of this is you're always getting better at the game you're playing. So the system, the medical system that we're in, and this is really a system broader, it's, it's our life, but we're looking at it through the, the lens of medical is that these days we have very little capacity to sit with our discomfort and our feeling like something's wrong. We go to the medical system and we want a solution fucking yesterday. If you don't already have a solution for me, hello, Peter. If you don't already have a solution for me, you're already not doing good and I need it now. Can you give me a pill to alleviate this? Hurry up. I want this addressed. So consequently, we shift into medicating, addressing, treating our problem, our problem very quickly. And it's worth noting here that the depth to which we can address a problem is directly correlated with how long we can wait before we treat the problem. As soon as we treat the problem, we're trying to get it to go away. And so if like pain starts to, you know, if this is the timeline, so to speak, the level of depth we're getting to, and we come down and we're like, ah, something's wrong, treat it. And we immediately treat it. That's as deep as we can get into resolving this. And because of the way things are set up, we tend to resolve things quite close to the surface because we over time have gotten better and better and better and better at operating in this particular model and system. And as a result, we we don't have a capacity to get very deep in terms of being with our discomfort. We don't have a capacity to sit with stuff. And as a result, we treat things very quickly at the surface level. And so we, we, we don't tend to really resolve stuff. So the ontological model for looking at things like disease, the way it works is we stop looking at the problem as it's showing up. And we start looking at the problem, not as an external factor, but as a function of the underlying way of being someone is bringing into the world. I'm going to provide an example to make this clear because I know I'm using a bit of jargon. So thanks for hanging out with me because this is something I'm still in the process of distinguishing. That's why I want to bring this to like some of the people I'm engaged with are medical professionals so that they can kind of like, you know, help me 
refine this to the point where it actually can can stand alone as, as a, a thing to invite people into. So let's imagine we've got someone and you know his name, it's Reggie, obviously. And Reggie was raised by an abusive, alcoholic, violent father, no mother in the picture. Uh, let's assume that his father did something horrible to her and she's no longer around. Reggie grows up with a father that attacks him, sexually abuses him, is violent and is unpredictable. There's no knowing for Reggie, is, are things okay? How, you know, there's, there's no safety at all at home. And what most of us do in like a, at a, we could call like average standard, daily, normal, whatever, uh, childhood is we go out into the world and we push into boundaries. We push out of what's safe and then we return home to the homeostasis. We return home to the safety, the unconditional love of our parents, our guardians. And that allows us to integrate what's happened. Reggie has none of that. Reggie can't, there is no safe space. The place that is meant to be the safest for Reggie, his caretaker, the person, his father, is the least safe, causes him harm, causes him violence, is unpredictable, cannot be trusted, cannot be relied on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you imagine being raised, growing up, formulating yourself in this kind of setting, we're going to see a few kind of like conclusions drawn by Reggie. Those conclusions would be like, there is no safety. There's no point where you can rest. It's never safe. If you're asleep in your bed, that's when you get abused sexually. So you've got to be on guard for that too. Even that which occurs safe to you is dangerous, violent, and damaging and risky. So you can't be around that. You can't rely on that. And you, because there's no point where you can rest or be safe, you must be hypervigilant. You must be always aware of danger and you must attack first, attack the problem, not necessarily your father, but like be proactive. There's no time to react to something. You must ideally be out in front of everything. So this is the sort of like learning about the world and about life that Reggie gets as a result of how he's been raised. And so Reggie's going to create like those are both rules about what life is like and then also some ways of being Reggie's going to create to compensate for them, right? If there is no safety, then the practical way of being is never rest, never let your guard down, always be vigilant, right? It, it makes sense. So that way of being for Reggie becomes the system he's entrenched in. That becomes the internal state for him. And even if he eventually leaves his father, let's say at 13 or something, he runs away from home, two things are going to happen for Reggie. One, that, that set of kind of rules and ways of being and ways of showing up in life, that becomes Reggie's modus operandi. That is how he lives life. It's because as a child growing up, he didn't have the opportunity to be like, oh my God, this is really rough but this is temporary and this is only related to my dad. I know that the world out there, no, none of that happened. That was life. That was truth. And so Reggie's going to leave and enter into the rest of the world from that same place. And the second thing that's going to happen is he's inevitably and innately going to seek out situations that fit in with that. If his system is looking for the fight, he's going to find people that bring the fight. So Reggie even if he doesn't want to, is naturally going to find his way into situations that are a mirror for the, the way things used to be. And in this way, the system persists. So imagine now that way of being that we've described. Imagine what would that look like in terms of Reggie's immune system? Like we can look at various parts of the the whole being and imagine this particular way of being being affected inside a particular aspect of who Reggie is of this whole holistic system. So that immune system is going to be hypervigilant. It's going to never be able to rest. It's going to know that there is no such thing as safety. Even when something appears safe, attack it because it knows that you must be proactive. There is no reacting in this world. Reacting is deadly. Reacting gets you abused and violated. So attack first and foremost, and don't trust what occurs as safe. Attack that too. That's the only safety is for you to trust that there is no safety. And so if you imagine an immune system working like that, we can start to imagine like, huh, there might be some really predictable results that would come out of that, such as something like an autoimmune disease. We might see something like rheumatoid arthritis. 
where the immune system that Reggie has is attacking this, the very scaffolding, the very parts of his being that are meant to be there, that are there to, to allow things to work properly, to let Reggie be safe. Even that can't be trusted. So the immune system attacks that. Be proactive. It looked at me funny. I don't know if the immune system would say that, but like, ha, attack it. That is what is safe. On a lower level, on a, on a slightly less dramatic level, we might see something like allergies, where the immune system has an overinflated response. It blows up as soon as it sees something that it thinks might even closely be a danger. And the interesting thing about your allergies is it's not the agent that's the issue. It's your immune system's inflated, hyperreactive response that is so dangerous. Peanut, a peanut doesn't have any deadly thing in it. It's your immune system's response to it that causes all the problems. And so you, hopefully you're starting to get the idea of like this ontological basis where we, it's not that we take away treating the symptom that's showing up. If you fall in a hole and break your leg, it's important we start to understand what has Reggie continue to fall in holes. But if all we do is that, he's gonna be walking around on a broken leg and that's gonna cause him pain and more damage. So we have to treat the problem as it's showing up. We're not saying throw out the medical system, throw out treatment of problems. What, what the ontological model of disease is suggesting, is inviting, is broadening our scope. Stepping like from a transcendent step to something greater so that we can have more capacity to work with what's showing up, including treating the symptom as needed. And what this starts to do is a lot of the stuff that currently doesn't make much sense, like say fibromyalgia or stuff like that, starts to make a lot of sense through the lens of the underlying way of being that has been adopted by that system. And from that place, we can start to be like, oh, wow, no wonder this is showing up. And until we actually address this underlying way of being, this, this fear that like nothing is safe and we must attack proactively, that's the only way we can be safe. We can never rest, blah, 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 until we can start to address that problem as part of our treatment, it doesn't matter how much we dull or numb or dim the, the nervous system, the immune system, the whatever, the way of being will persist like grass growing through concrete. So that's the, that's the paper, I guess you could call it like a white paper. It's the paper that I'm working on for this ontological model of disease, building this out. Disease, not D-I-S-E-A-S-E, -E, but disease D-I-S hyphen E-A-S-E, dis-ease something in the system that is out of whack, that is not, inter not aligned with the ease that is naturally our birthright as humans. So it's cool, it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna break that up and try to make that into a post that kind of makes sense, a series of posts. And if you have thoughts about that, I'd love to hear them because it's kind of a work in progress right now. So, that's me talking. It's time for us to get someone else. So um, briefly before Anna puts her camera on, um, uh, Nadine, I would love for you to share more what you have a hard time with. And, and I wanna be clear that the ontological model does not, it's not to suggest that every problem is always the function of a disease. Uh, sorry, is always the function of a being, right? Like if someone stabs you with a knife, we have to treat the knife wound. And so it's not, a, it's not about sort of saying like in broadening our model, we oh, this is always the answer. Rather it's broadening our scope so that we can see more of the picture that might be at play. And I, I guess I wonder, you know, as a parent of a child with type one diabetes diagnosed at 2.5, do you have a desire? Would, would it, do you have a, a hard time just with the idea that there might be something more to what's going on. That would be the place to sort of, um, I think, start taking a look at that to see if like, oh, well, well, it does feel like there might be something more than just the answer that we have. And if not, that's okay too, right? None of this is sort of to be imposed on someone. It's an invitation. Um, Andrew's writing, it's interesting as I wonder when we talk about the immune aspects, how to create that natural prevention. Both of my boys have had childhood asthma and I've always wondered about the causes, yeah. And uh, Mia's saying, check out adverse childhood experiences, uh, impact on health if you haven't already, Adam. Might be useful background reading for what you're working on. Thanks, Mia, I will, absolutely. Um, and Andrew's saying, especially when really asthma was a rare thing to see when I was a childhood, in my childhood teenager years, it seems so much more prevalent. 
Yeah, it's really, it's interesting. Um, one of the things about peanut allergies is that if you look at the rise of peanut allergies, as far, like how fast that's been onset, that, that's, that's become a, a significant thing. It doesn't align with the number of generations that have passed. Like, um, I think it's epigenetically, I think is the correct term. In terms of like genetics and, and population shifts, there's a number of generations that have to kind of come through for a biological change to manifest itself in a particular population. And the people I've listened to talk about how um, uh, what's happened is faster than our generational, like than the biology allows for. So there's something else at play. Um, and Nadine saying it comes with guilt because I wasn't able to nurse him and he was bottle fed plastic bottles and formulas from a can. Oh, got it. Yeah. Part of the challenge of, of all of this is to relinquish the guilt, you know, like, and, and I know that's a lot easier said than done, but the truth is that um, we as parents and we as children and we as lovers and husbands and wives, like we are doing our very best. And um, there's probably a, broader conversation here, but the intention of the ontological approach to disease is never about blaming or making someone wrong. It's never about um, having someone like put into a place where it's like, and you caused this and it's your fault. That was a big thing when um, autism was initially getting looked at. It was sort of held like, oh, this is the result of parents being brutal to their children. And then of course, parents would be out with their autistic children that they loved and feel so much guilt. And that's a total failing of the system. So I appreciate you sharing that, Nadine. It's really important that we acknowledge and work with that aspect as well. That's absolutely not what this is about. Okay, we gotta talk about Anna, cause she's rad. So before I bring Anna on, the context for this was that um, I'd started to see the path opening up in front of me to, to, to integrate plant medicine, specifically ayahuasca, perhaps a little bit psilocybin with the work I do ontologically with my clients, with my groups, coaches, clients, all of that leadership. And I started to invite uh, people to come down with me. And Anna and another client, Aaron, and Anna's husband, Peter, were the first three people that said, yes, I we're down for this. So Anna, let's get you on and, and we can start to walk through this together. Hello. 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 Do you have a cool mug? I uh, know. I yes, but I, I it's not. I'm using it, so let me mute my phone. Actually, like I don't know why it's making noises. Okay. Is so this related getting... to the cool mug? <laughs> no, it's not. It's a just, side sidebar. It's distracting. I, I have my phone open to see like the comments. You know. So. Uh yes, yeah, I do that too. I've got. But yeah, two no, windows. no cool mug today, unfortunately. No cool mug. Someone sent me a really cool one, but it didn't get picked tonight. That's right. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Sometimes you don't get picked. That's how she goes. So let's start here. Like what, what was the first um, point you'd had ayahuasca even enter your consciousness? Was it through me? Was it through something else? Like what was that for you? No, um, before you, um, Nathan Seward, my, the coach, right, who connected us initially, um, he did ayahuasca. So that's mm. when I heard it for like the very first time. And then I think quite soon after I heard it from you. Mm. Yeah. And so, so what was your, how, how was it sitting? Like what, you know, how did it exist? <laughs> you? Yeah, yeah. Tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, I was like, this is so weird. Or now mm. I, I have to stop working with Adam or something like that. You know, like he's going there and I will never go there. <laughs> right. Um, I was, yeah, and I was like, oh, but what's he talking about? And this is so far away, like from anything I like believe in or yeah. So the first thing was like, mm. away. <laughs> right, keep it, keep it at, I don't want anything to do with it kind of. Yeah. And what like, so th that was the initial thought. And then was mm -hmm. that uh, born out? Like, you know, you and I obviously kept working together, stayed in relationship. Yeah. And like, I'm genuinely curious, was there moments where in our work, you were like, oh, this feels like ayahuasca and it's weird. Or like, how did that evolve for you? At least after that initial thought showed up? Um, well, it kind of went back into the background a little bit because, um, 
you didn't change all that much in a sense you know you were still Adam and it was still cool to work with you so you know like I was I was cool with you doing that weird stuff in the jungle right so it got pushed a little in the background and when I picked up working with my therapist in January um there was this desire or like I mean we even before we worked together but like in a more broad lens I was like on a on a journey to discover my feminine side more and let me how do I put this together but like there was just this growing um desire to tap more into my feminine pressure myself less there was this like yeah I would pressure my, I mean you know that right like I would pressure myself so much shoot myself so much and I had this growing desire to follow my intuition and, and follow what was there for me and then you kind of seem to soften mm. into this more and I realized that this was ayahuasca I mean I attributed it to ayahuasca and like now I would even I would still do that you know like I, I could feel you would actually go into a direction as a coach I thought I I found very desirable you could, does that make sense um, mm -hmm. let, let me let me like just um yes please uh break this up so we can kind of walk through so like after that initial which would have been about three years ago give or take when I first went and sat yes and so initially there was like, oh boy, this is crazy. What's going to happen? This guy's gone loopy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to be able to. And then pretty quickly, it sounds like you were like, it, it just sort of faded away. It it, yes. it didn't, it wasn't in the forefront. It wasn't like I was pushing it on you. And it stayed there for a long about time. It. Yeah, gotcha. And then, and then as, as like the next time I was able to go sit because of COVID was about two years later. So almost a year ago. And that it sounds like was the point where you, it, it kind of came back a little bit into yeah. the forefront for you. Yes, exactly. So when I kind of started to shift, even though like when you first shared, oh, I think I want to start to bring clients. I was like, okay, not me, not me. But there mm. was also a sort of um, a knowing that something had shifted in you that I really liked as a client mm. so it sounds like the first time it wasn't there wasn't a particular like oh that's the change or I'm noticing something different but then as mm -hmm. as I'd gone back and sat you started to notice some other shifts over time kind of coming into who I was being with you in our coaching is that mm -hmm. a correct way to put it got it and so you were doing work with your with your therapist you were sort of working to embrace the aspect of you, the omega, the feminine, the divine feminine, yeah. a little more drive, uh, sorry, a little less drive, a little less purpose, a little more experience in the moment, you yes. know, softening all of that. And so was there anything else happening before I made the invite to you? Like any other stuff that we should make sure we touch on? Um, don't think so, actually. Not much. Okay, cool. So I'll share some of what was going on Yes. for me in the background and then and then we'll come back so like on this side uh, the first time i went down and sat three years ago I, I was like oh my god this is very much similar to the work i'm already doing and this feels like the path i'm supposed to be on on some level ah, i guess i meant to be a shaman and i came home and i was all fucking crazy about it and then two years passed before i could sit in a ceremony again and 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 i got supported from a shaman i was working with out here and so i came back down a year ago or whenever it was much more sober, much more like, all right, I'm going to be cool about this. I'm not going to like run off to Costa Rica or live in the jungle or anything. And much to my surprise, at the end of the zero, and I was still like, ah, this is really clearly the path. Like I can really feel it. And that was the point where if it's like a pendulum where initially I was sort of like, things are great and nothing's to change. And then the pendulum, I was kind of struck by perhaps my passion was like, ah, this is amazing. And I need to run towards this. It was almost like I was in repeated sittings with the medicine, finding my true North, as opposed to my passion overflowing or like kind of just keeping everything at bay. And I think it was maybe four months ago where I started to realize a couple of things and then we'll check back in with you, Anna. First was, oh, like, I'm going to be doing more work with this medicine. And I really feel called to like, bring my clients, those that want to, there's no push, but bring my clients down to do this. And so I started to look at like, one, how can I create, what do I have to shift in my practice and how I'm working with people initially to allow for that? And two, who would I really love to have come down? 
So how did, that's what was happening in the background over here. How was this transpiring for you, Anna? Like, what were you present to? What was showing up for you as I was doing that? Um, yeah, I feel like still more confrontation and um, just sort of deciding for myself, um, basically having survival show up and be like, whoa, 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 <laughs> that's not like, he, sh he, should, he, he shall do that thing and I shall not yeah. be involved. So that was kind of the first, and I think it's hilarious thinking of, you know, when you actually ask me, I would answer said yes. <laughs> I didn't even uh, know where right. I came from. <laughs> so initially there was like, okay, he's, he's doing that stuff, but it's cool. I don't have to do it. And, and I'm not going to. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I started, I, I shared, you know, with all my clients, yourself included, here's, here's the way I'm restructuring. Here's what's going to happen. Well, so yeah, I'm just curious. That. Yeah. Speak to that, please. Yeah, like that, for some reason, you started to end up in my spam and I, I never got it for That's a long right. time. I remember this now, yeah. And then I was like, wait, two calls, you know, like shifting your model and like two calls a month and weird open calls. And so, yeah, I was really, I was quite confronted by that. It was like, I got right. it too late. I just got basically, oh, here's the agreement. Yes, because <laughs> like, you and I were what? in a conversation about <laughs> renewing, basically renewing. starting up again. And I'd shared with all my clients, hey, this is this shift that's happening. Here's why. Here's the vision I have. Here's what I think is available. If we move to this, this is why I think this is even better. And I got none of that. She just got like an email from me like, okay, we were sort of at the point where it was like, what do the logistics look like? And I basically sent you an email saying, here's what they look like. And we're like, what the fuck? More or less? Yes, pretty much. Wow. <laughs> got it. Yeah. So what what happened? How did that go? Like, where did we go together in that? Uh, well, I, I think I spoke to that. It, it it brought up a very good conversation around money. And I'm still on that money project to really shift my beliefs around money. And the intro you shared about, you know, like this, this need to have more money to feel more safe. Mm -hmm. So I think I've been there a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm so that that was one thing that was actually independent from Rhythmia in a sense or from, you know, like sitting in ceremony. I think what um really contributed to me saying yes immediately when he actually invited me to come down and do ayahuasca was how we handled this conversation you know like mm -hmm. how you would literally like reinforce this like trust i already have like let's slow it down let's have a conversation outside of of our agreement um and really look at this mm -hmm. um, so this I, being our work together or or sitting in ceremony reinvesting the money and then oh, gotcha. Yeah, so that was kind of separate for me. I didn't even get that you, you know, wanted to shift to bring clients at the time. That was like right. two different things. And but then this most likely contributed because it would, you know, like it was one of one more of those things where I was really like, okay, I really trust you, you know. Mm. And like how you held me in this conversation again for me, like I would describe it as a softening. I don't know, like, yeah, how how it's but to me, it occurred as, you know, like where you went as a coach has been super enrolling for me actually mm. and I guess that actually overall contributed a lot to me them being a yes immediately does that make sense uh-huh yeah so we're we're blurring the lines a bit I just want to make sure that they're yeah it's kind for of me, clear even like, though they were <laughs> yeah. yeah so the experience we had together as we walked through the stuff that showed up concerns yes. about working together all of that you described softening the other thing that was really present for me was a lack of attachment on my side just like i'm mm -hmm. yeah. i'm here to support you however you want yeah. if you want and if not mm -hmm. i'm here to love you and and sort of make this complete as it is and then from there came the invitation once we'd once we'd gotten through that and yes. you were a yes and we started mm -hmm. working together was when i reached out to you and said hey there's invitation yeah. I'd like to make. And it sounds like there was less enrolling to do there because the relationship we'd already created and you choosing back in was sort of like a ground in which you were sort of willing Absolutely. to like choose yeah. in. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. That was it. Like, I mean, I said yes in a moment, pretty much. Right. And that was really coming from, and the, the thing with shifting your model was just a tiny bit, I guess, but it was another bit of of me really trusting you and I was mm. like okay if see something for for me in this it must be you know like I, there was no hesitation because yeah from like from from essence from like you know trusting 
our relationship and and what's there you know like a, a sort of surrender comes up as well you know we have worked a lot on that even before ceremony to just choose what sort of seems to be in front of me aha uh aha -huh. uh -huh. so when i made that invitation like i get you were just like it was an easy yes for you but was there anything that came up like in the moment because i know stuff came up afterwards but i'm curious in the moment was there anything that kind of came forward or was it just like i trust oh, yeah yeah so what showed up in the moment well, fear as well as possibility you know like i was terrified <laughs> it's like what's happening what are you uh -huh. doing here why are you saying yes like at least part of me you know so right the whole like time leading up to this i mean i had fear come up again and again and i had it come up like there is this part of me being a clear yes immediately and of course the other part arguing like what the fuck? <laughs> mm, right because yeah. I remember, I remember um, you were the early yes, and mm -hmm. your husband, Peter, was sort of, well, let's slow down. Let's mm -hmm. see, you know, yes. he, he required a little more, I guess I just call it conversation and support before he got himself to a yes. Yeah. And um, like, how was that for you? You being an immediate yes and him sort of just being a little slower? Um, better than another, like we learned. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um i did some like enrolling or i got curious but i was really like you know like i don't want to push you but i would be like hey adam really offered to talk to you please take him up with that you know because he doesn't just say that so i would um be like use the opportunity you have right and if if you end up at the no or if you really don't want me to go like so i was really like opening up the not yeah, that wasn't too terrible. I would re I really hoped he would just be a yes. Yeah. But it was okay. Yeah. Like and, yeah. and I thought it made sense because he, I mean, he has a history of of his wife becoming a, a like more and more involved in this whole world and him being a little like a little bubble. <laughs> right. Just stop uh, pushing. Stop pushing. You're getting yeah. a little crazy. Yeah. That, I mean, that can be base experience of me too, right? I get my passion inflamed and then I'm like, yeah. we got to do yeah. something. And it, it can happen both ways in our relationship. But anyhow. So so you had that immediate yes, more or less. You were kind of present to what's possible, really trusting. Peter required a bit more conversation. And then as time went on, it kind of swapped. Yeah. Right? Like you got more present to the fear behind this. So walk us through that. Like what, what happened over those ensuing weeks? What was that like for you? How did that kind of come to formulate itself? Um, I think what was really present for me a lot of the time was like, I've never done anything. I had a lot of like memories come up from my parents, but I mean, just being just being drunk, basically, not badly, but you know, Did I hear you right? yes, like being you drunk? have a really yeah. happy evening and for, for it was terrifying for me as a child mm. or memories of my dad having his like shot every evening along with his pain medication. So I had a really like, you know, like, ugh. I would, mm. I wouldn't drink actually until Peter, when I was 26 and we got together and I was like, you really have to try this. It's fun. And then I was like, oh, yeah. okay, okay. So, so I would be the substance is very much like, well, oh, loss of control was on the forefront right. of my mind. It was like, um I'm not ready in a sense I mean like always you know when there is possibility for me like before every forge call I would co-lead I would be like I hate this shit you know like so uh, this would come right. up like why do I do this this is terrible it's gonna be really weird um so yeah it's sort of just have all sorts of arguing going on around the craziness of this and how like a real fear like of losing control and experiencing really bad shit you know mm. so you know like having a really figuratively bad... you're talking experiencing bad shit bad stuff happening yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so there 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 i hear there is like the just the childhood and like kind of this this node mm -hmm. and just anything that alters your yourself yeah. that takes away from your control mm -hmm. and um was it like the way you described it was kind of hey karen nice to have you with us the way you described it sounded kind of like um, almost like a general fear of losing control. Was there anything specific to the ayahuasca experience that was sort of also there, uh, sort of like I'm and I'm also scared of that? Or for you, was it just more generally speaking that that sort of I don't know what's going to happen. I'm letting go of control. 
more that mm -hmm. more that mm -hmm. and i avoided reading too much about it actively actually uh, because i wanted to go in and just sort of experience it uh -huh. myself gotcha. yeah i think it was mostly this like generalized thing yeah although i would read about pooping i was a, well, I, I was a little worried about that yeah that's what i wanted i was curious about because yeah. for some people you know, there is that generalized, just like, mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm nervous of that, right? I'm surrendering a bit, which is a beautiful, you know, expression of the, the Omega, right? The feminine polarity, right? Yeah. It's like kind of exactly what you want. And it's very scary. But then there, for other people, there's like, just this fear, like, I'm afraid of throwing up. I'm afraid, afraid of pooing myself or whatever. Yeah, just pooing, though. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, that and was we're... particular, very, um, Vomiting, well, not so much, but it was the poop. No, actually, no, no. Uh, yeah, and basically just the aspect of, of shitting myself. <laughs> right. You know, not being able to go to the bathroom. And I think that was pretty much it. And everything else I would avoid. And, and really, yeah, I felt like I had a quite a, a experience of surrendering and trying. So to the point where when we would actually start and they would explain how it was for them, I'd be like, I don't want to hear this. You know, I really want to experience it for myself. So I, there is a lot more of that. And the generalized fear of letting go of something I've held on to very tightly as uh -huh. in control and um, be lucid. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so for you more like, ah, just going to let go. Um, what you and I talked a few times leading up to that, like, is there anything about that that you want to share that, that we looked at or spoke to or. Mm, yeah. Like I would say it always helped to, you know, hold it hold both ends a little bit like see possibility or you know, you know not go down the rabbit hole of this is going to be absolutely terrible so it was really right. present but it, it was also there was always possibility and at least some excitement and um i would say our conversations helped me shift a little bit towards back towards oh there's actually stuff possible there's not just you know like not oh, just crappy <laughs> darkness <laughs> right yeah. right cool so that kind of you know, like gets us to the week in question. So that's everything that's going on leading up to that. And and um, so why don't you share a little bit just about like, you know, arriving the the sort of beginning to the point where we then sat in ceremony, you know, like got to hang out together. What, what yeah. was present for you as, you know, in all of that? It was weird. <laughs> like, Please say more. You know. Yes. So um, I remember someone walked up to you and said, like, the medicine has made me a man. Yes. And I was like, what the fuck? Someone on their way out. Yes. Someone That's on right. their way yeah. out. Exactly. Yeah. And and so it was all, all of those, like, so for me coming from this very um, rational angle still, you know, even though I started to choose into spirituality and surrender a lot more, but it was still coming from this, like, quite rational angle. Um, let me let um, me just lay the, the speak to what happened there. So mm -hmm. we arrive Saturday or Sunday. I can't remember. And Saturday. the way it works is you've got some people that are finishing their week overlapping with you. And there was a guy Bay had met who came and started talking to me who lived uh, near on the island, the same island I live on in a place called Tofino, a surf uh, city actually here on this island. And as Anna was describing, I was asking him, how was this week? And he said that, you know, I, I showed the medicine helped me show up as a man for the first time, like a man, as opposed to a boy for the first time in my life. That's what Anna's describing. So that, that showed up, you had some opinions or thoughts or feelings about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think up until, you know, like this point where we actually would sit in there, I mean, lots that happened, you know, and uh, like, so incidents, the, yeah, go ahead. I would just say incidents where it was like, I think this is beyond what I can cope with mm. in terms of like sounding woo woo or out there. And I, I was kind of, I mean, I wasn't struggling super hard, but it really confronted me. Aha. Uh -huh. And they have classes in service of orientation, like helping you understand what's coming, helping you understand how to work with the medicine, helping you hear a little bit about the story of the founder and, and some of the people involved. How was all that for you? Yeah, that's mostly made it kind of worse because mm -hmm. for one I didn't want to hear people's experiences I wanted to just sort of like I said surrender to my experience in a sense right. and then yeah like they would like I said bring a lot of like out there aspects and not all of them 
So I think the founder story actually helped in a sense because it was quite down to earth. But some right. of them, like, you know, I did this, I started to take this medicine and then I did ayahuasca and then everything vanished forever. And it was like a little bit, you know? So right. um, there is good stuff as well, right? Like of giving, supporting yeah. with intentions or listening how, you know, like the founder, Jerry, got like a grip on his really bad addiction and, and stuff like that. But like overall, um, it overwhelmed me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um and i felt like stuff is sort of injected into me almost a little bit while i was more like okay i want to do and to sort of yeah again surrender the experience right yeah that makes sense okay so there's of course there's class story into you introduce you blah 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 but a lot of that occurred sort of like an imposition or like ah, if, if everyone can just bit. fuck off you didn't say this at all yeah. this might not even been your internal voice but you know like everyone leave me alone, then I can yeah, kind of approach me. this. Okay. And then, so we kind of relax, hang out, go to the spa together. Yeah. And then on Monday night, we go to sit in ceremony. So how was, I'd love for you to share sort of like, you know, leading up to and going and sitting in the room and then like the first night, but let's start with like the leading in, sitting down, waiting, all that stuff. How was that for you? Mm. I remember I was super surprised at the mattresses. I didn't, you know, like, like I said, I didn't do any, pretty much any research. I was like, oh, there's mattress. So it looked very, uh, like I was very intrigued. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, yeah, that was the part I started to like because it was about actually doing the thing in a sense. And like, it, it was, it felt even inevitable. It's like, you know, again, the, the, the call I might lead starts. So there is no way out right. in a sense, you know? So yeah. that made it easier. So there was the time of, overthinking was kind of over because I said yes I'm obviously I'm going to do it so it kind of got easier like I would still be quite afraid apprehensive maybe but in a sense um yeah like the commitment was there and yeah so I was very uh, ready and mm -hmm. I got a neat little corner that felt very safe picking a mattress and and I liked you know like how we before we went in how we lined up in front of the building and you know so all of that was kind of more to my taste in a sense in that moment because, let me just let me just provide some context so everyone knows so exactly. I was thinking and is describing the maloka the sacred space where they lay it out all with mattresses where people go and sit to sit in your ceremony you have a mattress a bucket a blanket you're given a pillow and prior to that we line up and sit waiting to be let into the sacred space so that's what you're describing now right anna mm -hmm. uh-huh please continue yeah so um and then i mean they give you some like explanations how it's gonna go and right and and then things get quiet before and then before it actually you actually start drinking the medicine and yeah like all of that felt like everything like i was really fascinated and intrigued by um you know the whole like rituals and and reverence that's immediately in the space and and so mm -hmm. yeah I was a lot more on board with that and I actually felt already felt like oh yeah I can you know like in a sense deal with this it just came easier to me mm. so I was actually a lot more on board then once you were in the sacred space once you could feel yes. the sort of the sacredness of the ceremony that was getting created exactly. that allowed <laughs> you to sort of settle down a bit yeah, that's not exactly the word you used, but you could be on board with. Yeah, that. but yes, totally. Uh, got it. Okay, and then so we're there, right? This is first night. Now you're in. You're you're doing it. So yeah. take us through your first night. Like, what are some highlights you can share? <laughs> or lowlights? Uh, <laughs> like I can probably like. Okay, we have to to include the next morning actually because so there was the first night. I didn't really understand. Um was like going on in my body as well or you know what the medicine would do in a sense i i think there was in hindsight there was a lot of resistance or expecting something to happen i was like well nothing seems to happen mm. um the medicine on the first night was quite in a sense quite brutal a lot of people threw up right like you <laughs> i think mm. you too right on the first night no and um, Oh, you didn't? I thought you did yeah. on the first line. Oh, yeah. So, but a lot of people did. And someone said, I've never seen quite it like that, like black. And, you know, so it was a mm. very, uh, it was quite deep and quite intense as the first thing, I guess. But yeah. I had no, I didn't feel anything or, you know, I, as much as I said, I don't want to lose control and trip. I somehow expected for it to happen because I'm very, um, 
how do you say that, like sensitive towards substance in general. I feel stuff um, quickly. And then I was like, I'm, I'm not getting this. I'm just, I threw up twice at the beginning and at the end. And, and it was kind of like, oh yeah, and we'd sleep below, right? And I felt rested the next day. I slept quite a lot actually. But other than that, I had nothing happen. So let me make sure uh, I'm, I'm catching everything. Uh -huh. You you drank mm -hmm. and there, there was like that, in my experience, the first night, generally people have a fair bit of resistance, yeah. just fear. Ultimately, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. And what do we do from our, our fear? Unconsciously, we, we wrap our hands around what is yeah. known. And so typically the first night as a result of that, that there's the medicine, it's engaging with our ego and it kind of has to work with it before it can really have the impact yeah. that we're there for it to have with us. And, but this night, I noticed the same thing you're describing, which was like, it felt like everyone dropped in pretty quickly. It felt like a pretty deep night relative to a lot of the first nights. And as you were saying, you know, dropping in can mean purging, releasing stuff, vomiting, farting, whatever. Also just people having the experience, yelling, laughing, crying, whatever. And if I'm hearing you right, you didn't have any of that. There was sort of this like, oh, it's going to be like that. It's going to be a certain way for me. And it wasn't, it sounds almost restful. Yeah. Was that how it occurred for you? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and me, yeah, like hearing people laughing, crying, whatever around me and be like, um, I'm not getting this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then like, what, what, what was actually really cool. Yeah. So again, sleeping a lot. Um, consequently, as in, I should feel something drank more than any other night. Uh -huh. Which still you drank more on the first night than any other yes. night. Yeah, and how much did you drink? Um, two and a half cups, so it wasn't a ton, but I like, I, yeah, yeah. Um, so for everyone, typically they would the the medicine team would call for the first cup of medicine. About an hour later, they call for the second cup, and they don't call for any more. But you're welcome to go up and drink as much as you want. So Anna drank basically a third time. You went up. Is that right? Yeah, got yeah. it. Please continue. Yeah, and I remember like this someone. Um, uh, be like almost I don't know it was like I think she felt something for me I didn't feel at that point mm. and then what actually was like sort of put the how to say set the, the set the mood for the whole remainder of the week was the next morning because I felt and I'm like thanks my training thanks you thanks all the work I've put in because I would have missed it the next morning I had like, this feeling of love and connection with myself and uh i had this insight of oh wait you don't have to compare you know like your experience it's just you know like no matter what others around you like i remember you sharing how you got something and i was like what am i doing wrong and the next day i was sort of like open mm. up to dropping all comparison mm. and i think mm -hmm. the medicine kind of seemed to have given me this gift and it was so tender and my whole week from then on was pretty much tender I would describe it as that very deep and very tender mm. um apart from physical experiences but right. like on, the, on a soul level you know I would feel this connection to my heart and it didn't leave me for the remainder of the week mm. um whether so, or not you were in ceremony mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was it would be more intense during ceremony so what do you think it was that the medicine brought you that first night like what was the medicine you were being given that opened that like that opened you up to allow for that experience? I think to confront me with comparison, actually, you know, mm. to let me have, because this is like, and and you probably know this having worked, like, you know, with me for a long time, I would always compare so hard and be like, oh, I'm not there. I should do what the, the other person does and confront me again with this only to show me the next day in a sense, it's not necessary, mm. was really powerful. So how would I get this lesson other than, being put into this comparison you know and feel really like falling short not getting experience not getting anything ish, right you know right so so that first night it sounds like there was a fair you were kind of in this like ah, i'm not getting what they're getting i'm not doing this i'm not vomiting yeah. the way they are I'm why not, are whatever. they crying laughing dancing uh -huh. whatever you know like why are they having crazy experiences and i'm just there and don't get it right and and um what work did you have to do to get that? Because, you know, like, 
it would be easy. We could just tell people the medicine just plucked it out of my brain, but that's rarely the way this works, right? The medicine brings us the thing there is for us to be with, and then we have work to do. So what, what work did you do to sort of like be with all that comparison and then set it down and realize like, I can just let that go. Or what did that work look like might be a different question. How did that actually, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I had this distinct sense of thanks, thanks ontology, you know, like thanks as coaching because I really felt like I could have missed it, but I'm not sure, but mm. actually in this moment made the difference. I think it, I, if I had to have a guess, it was probably along the lines of having worked with surrender and listening to my heart before. Mm. And, and what was your heart telling you? Yeah, like the invitation to drop comparison and, and like I felt a lot of like love, but yeah, again, like mm. not a loud one or just a tender like connection to myself and the tender invitation. Mm. And I don't really know what made me be like, oh, you know, this is what you meant when you said that those two are kind of exponential mm. when they come together. But this is, the, that's what, the, that's the sense I got. I was like, something with being very uh, in my being. I think it had to do with being well rested. It was a beautiful morning. I would walk up to yoga and just feel really open, you know, mm. in this moment to what was there and curious. So there is not a lot of thinking or resistance or whatever going on. Uh -huh. And in this moment, I had no expectations. That probably helped. So um, one of the things I hear in what you're sharing is like what you were feeling in your heart was like tenderness, love, surrender, openness. Mm -hmm. And then there was like this layer of comparison over top throughout most of the night. And then just came this point where you're like, what if I just set that aside? And then you got the gift of being with what your heart yes. was feeling. Uh -huh. yes. Cool. Okay. Here's, so I'd love for us to like, I want to give you a space to share any other highlights you want to share just about the week in general. And then I'd love for us to spend yeah. a little bit of time talking about integration, because yes. I think that's really yes. important. And you and I both know this work through ontological work, as well as medicine work. So, so what other highlights would you like to share about your week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I would say uh, overall, like I said, this like, how tender the experience can be for me was really surprising in terms of being connected to my heart and it all felt very simple to me and yeah like very mm. heartfelt not a lot of words actually so I would for example one evening I would go through grief and cry a lot um Peter heard me on the other end of the book <laughs> I was like um and I felt like I had a lesson every night almost mm. And when, once I went through this, um, I, I was back to, you know, like love and connection and, um, but yeah, like letting go of some grief that felt like generations back, especially my mom and my dad carried a lot of grief, a lot of suffering mm. um, and then getting rid of some anger and, and, you know, sort of, but all of it was, yeah, like I said, I, th I would say that the overall highlight for me was to find myself to ground all the work done mm -hmm. I heard something to yesterday about you know ayahuasca for me felt a little bit like a tether so I would finally sort of anchor all the work I've put in before uh -huh. uh, it does more like one overall highlight and really connect to my feminine like the omega the intuition I would push away so often and it felt like coming home mm. carry that with him because yeah, like you said, it's probably less the medicine itself, but more like um, a breakthrough that was bound to happen and the medicine helped it along. And it, uh -huh. yeah. Nice. I, I remember, you know, um, like I invited you down, right? And of course there's, I have, I'm holding you energetically on some level and mm. I really trust, just like I really trust the power of, a transformational coaching relationship. I really trust this medicine. And so I was like, you know, I trust Anna's going to get whatever there is for her to get. And I was, I know you, right. I know that you can like, all right, let's attack bit. this thing. Right. You know, like we're going <laughs> to, we're going to nail this thing. And, and while that's an amazing um, expression of the devotion and the commitment and the excellence you are just as a human being, it can also, you know, it can cause you some suffering. Right. 
And I was, I was sort of like, um, you know, the next morning after our first night of ceremony, I was like, I wonder, like, you know, I, I, I trust whatever showed up for Anna and I hope that there wasn't too much suffering. And it was really like wonderful to have you share and just hear like, Oh, wow. It, it was almost like the, that night you actually took on letting go of the suffering, like the suffering yeah. became optional at that night. It doesn't the mean there's not hard work. More. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. 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 That was kind of like the start of, of that yeah. all falling away. And you've been doing yeah. work on that probably for the last well mm-hmm. two years, really. But like, you know, the last, six months, especially it, it's not that there's not hard work. It's not that there's not stuff for us to do. It's not that we might not have to do. Th- we might have to do things we don't necessarily relish doing, but the suffering through all of it is the part that's optional. And it really sounded like my seeing of yeah. you was really like, you kind of released yeah. a lot of that, which is beautiful. Yeah. Uh-huh. Any other highlights you want to share? Anything other than six. I love the, I love the medicine team so much. Mm. What did you love about them? Their their intuition, them being so on point with what someone needs. Mm. Um, their kindness. Um, and just the overall space they hold. I think it's amazing. I mean, they drink the medicine too. Like how, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot less than we do. Yeah, <laughs> much less. Um, the medicine team that we're talking about is probably about four to eight people at the front of the Maloka sort of holding the main space. And then there's at least six to 10 other people throughout the Maloka holding that sacred space, keeping an eye on everyone, making sure everyone's all right and held and handled and, and given whatever support they need to support the work that they're going through. Yeah. It's, it really, for me, I often feel like, you know, what, one of the things I love when I meet a coach that's really masterful in their work is their being is really pristine. You know, they're really expressed, but they're also really like clean in their energy. They're not trying to be funny to meet their own need to be liked by people or they're not hiding, you know, whatever. And I feel the same way about the medicine team. People that are deep in this yeah. work are, their being is very pristine. There's a real grounded cleanliness to how they show up in the world. How did, um, so you said like coming in, one of the fears was like, I'm going to crap myself. How did that all end up being for you? Mm, well, I think the funniest part was about the, the fear of losing control. And I think I felt lucid throughout. And it wasn't mm. that I felt a need to. And I think, in fact, after the first night, I would be, okay, I'm just going to go in and not expect, I could really let go of expectations after the first mm-hmm. night. Yeah. So it would probably have been okay, whatever happened. But like, yeah, so, and and so I would sometimes strategize my way to one of the bathrooms. <laughs> right. Of course, because it's not all that fun, you know, but like, it's all right. You know, it was kind of less, a lot of things that confronted me at the beginning to sort of vanished in the background you know and uh-huh. I just sort of part chose to set things down like they invite us at the beginning of the week and part the medicine did its job I guess mm-hmm. yeah it's interesting isn't it the things we're terrified of yeah. are such small things you know like if if I think part of the challenge is hard for people to trust this but if we went to someone and they were like I really don't want to throw up and we we're like if you could create a breakthrough such that the panic attacks that you struggle with were gone for the rest of your life? Would you be willing to throw up for four days? And if they could trust mm. that that was available, they'd be mm. a yes, straight up. The trouble is the trust only comes from us choosing in. Once yeah. we choose in and we start doing the work, it doesn't mean it's always easy. And when you're throwing up, it's not always fun, but it, you stop worrying about it. And it just starts to be like, oh, I can see what's happening. I can really trust that this is releasing something. And okay, great. I'm here for it. I'm ready for this. Yeah. And then we can stop worrying about what's ultimately, it's not to make light of the fear someone has on the on the, the starting point, but like as we step through the work, we start to see like, oh, that's tiddlywinks. Like that's not the thing in my life to really be worried about. There's something yeah. much bigger that I'm committed to playing in my life. And that's a beautiful thing when we start to see it through that lens. Yeah. 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 I agree. Um, okay. Uh, anything else you want to share before we start to talk a little bit about integration after the fact, all of that? 
I could share for hours, but I love the integration part. <laughs> cool, cool. So let's say. <laughs> so yeah, what what's that been like for you? What's your experience been finishing up that week and then coming back home and or staying in, you stayed in Costa Rica for a bit first. So you can talk about yeah. that too, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, that was good to ease in. Like I wanted to go home, but it, in a sense, it was a gift to ease back in a little like less abrupt, I guess. Um, well, what, did, what did you literally do? In Costa Rica? Yeah. Oh People yeah, I'm like, what did you not, do? Not, oh, not a lot. Like we did, we did some surfing, but the waves were a bit crap. Um, but you stayed there for a week, right? After the fact. I, okay, yeah, perfect. we stayed on yeah. for a week. I would start to do some work and have lots of conversations with Peter. And I mean, he's he was integrating as well. I was just thinking, speaking of the highlights, he was a single highlight for me. And like, yeah. You want to share a bit about that? Oh, yeah, I can. Like, but I mean, it goes into integration as well. Like, it's so nice that we got through, went through this together. I really, really appreciated that. And like, there was this one evening when he shared like how he felt his own love. Mm -hmm. And I, I, even to sharing this moment, I could probably start to cry. I, I cried when he shared after the ceremony. And it's all been so different since like crazy, you know, nothing of that has in a sense gone away. Of course, you know, like, so we start to integrate some struggles come back. I was really worried at the beginning that I would just lose it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but like, actually, you know, it was more or less, I mean, I got this terrible cough from the AC in Costa Rica from what, whichever, but overall it was like expanding, 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 integrating in a very beautiful sense because like for one, I feel I reconnected with a part of me that's mm. always been there. And the invitation has always been there for me to, to step into that. And also, again, you know, like having you as a, you know, having not just you, but like be in a coaching relationship and ongoing commitment and all that has really helped to, and, you know, have the training before that as well. You know, like, right. so distinguish stuff. And I, I would be like, oh, I can, thanks to all the work done, I can integrate quite smoothly, I would say, you know, and it still mm. feels like that. It almost feels like I get more and more and more instead mm. of, you know, the medicine. Of course, you feel kind of high up there, but bringing it back to my life and realize how many things in my life I can actually now have agency to change in a sense where I would get stuck before. But now mm. I have sort of, I got some healing that really allows me to, into again, the tether, you know, like I got the tether and I'm like, oh, my life is so amazing. <laughs> I mean, not all the time, of course, but like, especially because I'm now so much more open to, um, to pain or to mm. stuff feeling bad or to shame, uh, feel shame or not shame someone, but like feel shame and have mm. it be like a lot more accepted as part of the human experience. And um, before I would spiral quite easily or get really stressed or, you know, and now I feel like, oh, I got an, just an extra layer. Mm. So I can, I can have my life, but a better version of it. Yeah, I really, I can hear, like, I can imagine there'd be a lot of richness just in being able to feel all of that stuff instead of having to either resolve it, push it away, get away from it, or have it just swamp you and, and take you over, yeah. like losing. It very often swamp me, you uh -huh. know, like I would be anxious and do whatever, like try to use all the tools and of course have some, like it would be a little better, you know, and it would point the right direction, but um, I just had no means, you know, to mm. sort of, it would just, yeah, like you said, swamp me completely and would be at effect of anxiety or pain sometimes. And I feel that I almost like I had a, I have a healthy layer or something, but a good one, not one that shuts out, but actually it's like, I can have it go through me and be least too. Uh -huh. Yeah. The distinction I'm hearing in that is sort of like those particular experiences of life. You were talking about pain, uh, shame, whatever, the way it used to occur is like there was Anna or there was pain and shame or whatever else was on that list. And, you know, the way that Anna was destroyed was either her whole everything became about avoiding it or it took over. And now the extra layer you're talking about almost sounds like you, like there's you grounded and then those experiences exist in you 
as opposed to as opposed to you, as opposed to the yeah. exclusion of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. That's beautiful. Very beautifully put. Thank you. Yeah, nice work. Um, how, if at all, have you found like our work, coaching, you know, the ongoing support? How have you found that supported the integration, or what have you just noticed in terms of like how those kind of interact? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about we have have we talked one on one since? Yeah, well, we did kind of yesterday. <laughs> I and I think we had a conversation before that too with Peter. Oh, maybe you're right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So we haven't actually had a lot of like one on one. To, but it doesn't really matter. It's more like the energy as well. And I've had support from you. Um, yeah, I think it's similar to what we just talked about. So um, I feel there is this breakthrough that happened where I can, in a sense, be a lot more courageous because I'm, I feel more safe mm. within myself. Like less like, oh, Adam, can you please fix this for me or help me, I don't know, hold on to something or... Uh, and this seems like it, it has only just started, but it seems to like open up a lot more new possibility. Mm. And I sometimes feel like we talk the language I have tried to speak, like a lot more the language of the heart. There is so much more peace and so much more like accessib accessibility. Is that mm -hmm. a word? To, to, to my yeah. heart at all times almost. And, and I really, and I think we both appreciate that. I uh, hope. I hope. <laughs> I noticed like a couple of things it, for me, you know, with my coach is one, it's nice to, it's just good to be able to share it. First of all, that like sharing is profound medicine. And then there's sort of like, it's really easy to create the medicine experience as this separate sort of sacred thing over there. And then like, if only I could get myself back there and my coach really supports me to like hold all of this as me unfolding. And so, yeah, you had this experience and, you know, you did some work with your back, Adam, or what physically your back, the, my lower back. And then my coach will ask me questions like, well, what, I don't know. She asked great questions that kind of bridged that back into the normal world. Like, well, how could you practice creating that same experience for you on a day-to-day -day basis or, or what, what would serve you as an ongoing practice to have this become blah, blah, blah. And, and then, you know, a few weeks later, I start to talk about stuff and she's like, well, how's that going? And, and it's sort of like, you know, it tethers us throughout. Yeah. It creates that yeah. thread of us amidst all of it, which is so important because as the peak experience starts to fade, yeah, we attribute a lot of the work to that moment in the medicine, as opposed to like, no, that was a window being open. We did a bunch of work and it also opened a window to show us more of what's possible. Our job becomes creating the door to step and stepping through it. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Um, what came up for me is for one, I will sure like see more of that going down the line, right? It's not been that long. It's been the first time. So right. I, but I feel like I can, I can see that going to happen. Yeah. And what was the other thing? Oh yeah, what came to mind for me was what I already feel I'm really grateful to have the container, like the coaching is um, to keep this tension between declaration, making stuff happen and surrendering the moment, bringing mm. the softness, letting like pain flow through or stuff like that. So to keep holding those poles so much more artfully, I'm really mm. looking forward to, you know, like keep that up with yeah. you because I don't think without, yeah, without support would be much tougher. I, I suspect, especially yeah. I mean, for me personally, I don't know in general, but for me, this is like such a tension sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We tend to do one of the other rather like fuck everything. I'm just focused on, I'm going to grind myself to death and make this happen. Or I'm just going to surrender to whatever's going on and be okay yeah. with not wanting for anything. But then, yeah, like to what you're describing is beautiful art, beautiful art and polarity and, you know, the dance of the divine, the divine uh, polarities. Um. What would you say to people that are like curious or afraid, but kind of drawn or, you know, like just what, what would you say to them? Mm. 
Uh, so far, well, what I already have done and would keep doing is to invite people to sort of be in conversation, mm. you know, with someone who has done it. Like I, I invite people, I have invited people who were curious to be, hey, you know, like ask questions. I, uh -huh. I'm, I'm happy to share. Um, yeah, that's kind of the enrollment style I tend to have. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it's so let good. Let me share like my, like what I, um, what I took from it or, you know, like what I really loved about it or I would probably share depending on who it is, but like when someone would share, oh my God, you know, like, it sounds so out there. I would be, yes, I agree, you know, like, so yeah. sort of really, mm, really just um, be with them and where they're at and, oh, yeah. and sort of show probably some possibility from there. That's what comes up for me. That's beautiful. That's the heart of enrollment right there. What you just described, <laughs> you know, like share our, ex here's what I got from it. Here's the gift it brought me. And when we are present to the gift we've been given by coaching, by yeah. plant medicine, by whatever, a lot of this stuff becomes very easy. We can stop trying to figure it all out. And it's, it's okay if you don't want it, but I'm just going to share what I got. Yeah. 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 It's been so obvious to me in the moment, you know, where people would relate to me. I saw some shared in the chat, like Mia said, she experiences me as different. So that too, you know, like the being, like you said, you know, I feel like my being is a lot more pristine than before. So mm -hmm. I bring that being and people tend to be intrigued, I noticed. Yeah. So yeah. that too. Well, you've created like a lot of, you know, the last six months have been pretty profound for you. You've taken <laughs> on a lot of work that was edgy for you to take on. You've, you, and you've created a lot of breakthroughs and, and it is very present. You know, I, I noticed the same thing that Mia's pointing to. There's, there's a softness and a, and a breath in your lungs and a, like just so much more capacity to be with, which is beautiful. Cause then, you know, you became, yeah. you, you create a clearing for us to be with what's showing up because you're just able to be with it, which is such a beautiful thing. So thanks. Thanks for doing that. Um, We've got a question from Karen that I think would be cool for us both to take a swing at. But before we do that, is there anything else you want to make sure we touch on as far as ceremony and, and any of that? Mm, I don't think so. Cool. Thing comes up in a moment. No. Awesome. So then, Karen, Karen Hoskin uh, asks us a question. Karen, thank you for this awesome question. I so appreciate when people um, bring these things. And Karen says, um, I may be on a plane, but we'll watch it post facto. Very nice, post facto. Uh, I learned in, in, as an aside in law school, or actually in court, I was in court and, and someone said to the judge, like, this is a de facto blah, blah, blah. And the judge responded and said, like, well, what about de jure? How is it? And what, what is being asked, the person's saying, like, the fact is this. And the judge was saying, yeah, but what's the law? What does this look like under the law? So now you guys know a little more Latin, which is probably why you're tuning into these lives. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough of that nonsense. Karen asks, how do we hold on to spirituality in the face of all the pressures and demands of life? How do we hold on to spirituality in the face of all the pressures and demands of life? So why don't you take a swing first, Anna, and then I can fix everything you've said and give the correct answer. That sounds like a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Very much like I know you. <laughs> yeah, I actually had immediately something show up because we said, you know, we would have a swing at this question. And I was like, well, for me, it's, it's always been a choice like before ceremony too, like to, to, I needed to make a very active choice to be spiritual. Mm. And like now it's a little less to choose, you know, it's like, it's become easier and more effortless mm. to choose. But I feel, I feel like what comes up for me is like, it's a choice anyway, you know, like you have life throwing stuff at you and, and wanting you to not choose spirituality, to not trust. Um, I know this like really well. And so through the work with you, first and foremost, but now also through ceremony, um, I find it easier and easier to choose and be like, okay, I have this like evidence throwing me in the face as in evidence, you know, like, okay, um, I know how this is going to go, life is throwing shit at me, but then I'm like, okay, and, and I still can choose and mm -hmm. I can choose to trust. So that's what I would actually first and foremost um say about this and I'm sure you have more to say but like for me what's really yeah the choice like we can make to be like choose to trust mm. always 
Mm. Yeah, I love that. Like the practice of choosing into trust as opposed to like yes. the circumstances in front of me yes. aren't supporting this. I will trust mm. after that's not yeah. trust. Yeah. 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 I know that game. Or, well. you know, I can trust now or um, I can't trust because, or this is just too big or too much, or, you know, like we always have, right. Like not having chosen into it traditionally yeah. in the past, it's not predictable to choose it going forward, but that's what I sort of practice. Mm, nice. Great answer. Um, now fix it. Uh, no, not a fix at all. This, but here's what I do see is the, in the question, how do we hold on to spirituality in the face of all the pressures and demands of life? What I notice in that is the context that spirituality is separate and distinct yeah. from all of the pressures and oh, demands yeah. of life. And that's a losing proposition because then it becomes I can have life or I can have spirituality. And the way to have spirituality is I hold life at bay. So even if you're winning at that game, you're winning like your Atlas holding, I've got this guy right here. This, <laughs> don't fall over telescope. You're this guy. Mm -hmm. This guy is, I've got spirituality. I'm holding life at bay. Ah, this is cool. I like this by the way. Um, that's a rough game to be playing. So even when you're winning, you're kind of like, you're gonna be exhausted and tired. And, and so one, thing just as a starting point you may look at Karen and anyone else sort of in this conversation is do you find yourself exhausted and tired and if so it might be because you're trying to win at this game where spirituality is separate and for me I think partially as a natural offshoot of just this work like the more I take on my own transformation the more all of it becomes more spiritual but like starting from the point of like the pressures and demands of my life are that is yeah. the spirit that's spirit what what does if this is the pressure showing up for me right now what is that message from spirit that i'm being given all of it is sacred yeah. how can i bring more reverence to it as opposed to like i need to push that away so that i can have reverence and that's just it's not a very fun game it can be way um, more fun go ahead anna please i was just like yes of course like I, I would say that was even one of the biggest things i learned in ceremony say more and something i really practice every day now like, you know, after ceremony, we're like, what would be more alpha practices of, you know, like bringing rigor to spirituality? But on the other side, there is this like really beautiful practice of doing it in the moment. Mm. Like, you know, so, oh, feeling into, I had this incredible experience being in a concert. And I shared this, you might have seen this, where it was like a cough is coming up. And I was like, shit, what are we going to do? A, a classical concert with a world famous pianist and I had to cough and it was really bad and then I was like well what if I got curious about the sensation in my throat and I got so present um I didn't have to cough but the music was like magical as hardly ever in my life and I've done a lot of music you know I've been in concert and yeah like whoa you know like spirit coming at me in a sense or being in me because I surrendered to something really uncomfortable and scary and painful. Yeah, yeah um, that's great practice. That's just one example of like, yeah, I mean, ever since being constantly is exactly what you described, like going through and seeing spirit in everything, in, in, in pain, in, in discomfort. Yeah, yeah, Ben, I practice the art of sacred yoga every morning. So we sit down, we practice creating intimacy with us, beginning just with our breath and our eye contact. and. And then we have specific, our teachers give us specific practices we're working through. Some some mornings it trends more towards desire, sexuality. Other mornings it's more towards building trust and love. It, it varies. The reason I'm sharing this is like some mornings we're there and something's showing up in the space. Like for example, I feel crunchy or Bay feels close to me, and I can get into the space where I'm like, "Fuck, Bay needs to open more so we can do the practice." That is the practice. That moment is the practice. Is like, can I be in my yeah. crunchiness? Can I be with Bay in her closure? Can I hold that moment as sacred and practice with that yes. rather than <laughs> once I get there, then I can do the practice. So yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sharing this so it's clear. No pedestal here. No, like I have this sorted out. I 
fight with this myself. And this is what I've found. I I know, fired. (laughs) Fired. (laughs) But like, this is what I find works for me is when I notice that I've created this separation and I can bring them back together and like, oh, wait, I am experiencing a moment of spirit. What is there? What am I being called to bring in? Cool. Well, I think we did it, Anna. I think we we did pretty, that was pretty cool. Anything to make sure we speak to before we wind down? Mm, Nothing over here. Cool. You said you could talk about your ceremony, your experience for another eight hours. Are you doing anything like that? Or have you done anything like that? Like if people are like, Um, oh, I'd really like to follow along. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of thinking about, I I started like something like an email series um, on it to actually share like right now it's six things, like six lessons or six learnings. Mm. I'm like actually currently writing down. So that's kind of, yeah. And I will share more on my social media as well. Yeah. So if people don't yet follow you, where is the best place for them to follow so they can make sure that they get that? Probably Instagram. Instantgram? Yeah, Instantgram. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. I make jokes like that. And then people are like, Adam, it's Instagram because they don't get that I'm making fun of the fact that I'm a dork. So they are, anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So follow you along with Instagram. Who are are you? What your name is not what I expected. Yeah, I have a weird handle on Instagram. That's actually a problem. I should probably change it to something easier. I, I don't know. I can write it. Yeah, put it in, yeah. put it in these. Uh, yeah, I can put it in. Oh, there it is. I'll, yeah. I'll copy it in there. Copy. I've got it in here. Oh, it didn't work. Paste. It didn't work again. Anna M. It doesn't like you. H-A punked. Yeah, it means. Oh, weird. It, it means okay. Anna H dot. We'll figure it out. We'll put it in after but the it's, fact. It's, it's yeah. translating it into your, uh, your other stuff. Um, a few last comments. Mia says she's definitely here for the law tips and the Latin tips. So you're welcome. Yeah, of course she's. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, Alexandra. Hey, Alexandra. It's nice to see you. She says, so interesting. I have the tendency to go deeper into spirituality in face of hardship, difficulty, and pressure. And she says, which is not great, but it's actually like, that's cool in its own way. And it's neat to see our bias. So it's sort of like, oh, I can access spirit when it's hard. But then when it's softer, that can be, oh, this isn't quite as challenging or whatever. So maybe spirit's not here. And, you know, it's beautiful. It's all beautiful, which is kind of cool. And uh, Peter's put your, uh, Peter's yeah, got he your made, he made a yeah. uh, He made a mistake, though. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we'll get him to change that. <laughs> Um, and Karen, who, uh, hi, Karen, it's so lovely to see Karen. We've got two Karens here and Karen Richter, Karen Duick Richter went and took coach training with me long ago when we were butt babies, Karen and I, and Karen says, I'm interested in mind altering substances as I explore it more and more. I've had to first simply jump over that it's wrong and bad. Uh huh. We were taught that weren't we? I know one person who'd used mushrooms a few times and it's brought a connection and all is well perspective. He knows, he, he says he knows himself so much more now. I think knowing I am a being, in essence, spirit, having a human experience. I'm just going to summarize some of this. Uh, I'm opening up to new old paths of discovery. I'm happy to be even, be open to these mysterious ways of healing. I appreciate your talks here. Thank you, Karen. It's lovely to see you. And thanks for um, sharing that. And I really, um, the, the period, I guess I'll put on this for me, is growing up, I used a lot of mind-altering substances without any reverence very irreverently just to have fun, get kicks. The light show is fun. It's it. Ayahuasca is fun for that regard. But um, when we bring reverence to it and sacred ceremony, um, it's amazing how much that adds to it. And that's really, I think, what has it be transcendent of wrong and bad. Not that having fun is even wrong and bad, but like it really is something much different than the way societally we tend to hold these things. And it's cool that you're exploring that. Anything you want to plug before we finish up, Anna? Cool. I got two things. One, the forge. It rules. We have three spots remaining. Anna is one of uh, the people on our leadership team. This is her third year, your third year with us. Um, So if you think people like this and people like this are awesome, we obviously do. You should come hang out with us. (laughs) Nine months, deeply transformational. Um, It's for coaches and leaders that want to create transformation in their own selves and then from that foundation, support others to create transformation. So you learn how to affect this kind of stuff. Um, And then the other thing is, who do you think you are? Comes out in one month, precisely. September 12th is our launch date. Um, 
if you like the idea of like the ontological model of disease or other stuff like that, uh, that book kind of speaks a little more in depth, not necessarily to our dis-ease, but more just who are we on, to, what, who is the being that we are and, and how to work with that and develop leadership from that place. So um, follow along, you can email me or send a message. If you're like, I wanna be a part of that launch, I'd like to get a book discounted on the day of, let me know so I can ensure you, I include you on the list. Thanks, Anna, I love you. You're awesome. It's an honor to get to be a part of your process and partner with you. And um, love all of you for coming and hanging out and witnessing this and, and really being a part of the shift that is happening. Bye guys, enjoy yourselves, have a good weekend.